When you have a problem, Fox 12 gets you answers. The violence continues. When crime hits too close to home, we want to make sure your voice is heard. We're listening and ready to confront your problems head on. How can Fox 12 help you? Tell us at kptv.com. Thank you for listening to BRC and Friends. This is another episode that is done in partnership between First Presbyterian Church of Palo Alto and BRC and Friends. In this series, you're going to be hearing from candidates for the Palo Alto City Council. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. My name is Bruce Reyes Chow, and this is BRC and Friends. Each episode, I chat with activists, artists, academics, and adventurers to discuss politics, faith, pop culture, technology, and as you will discover, pretty much everything else that pops into our heads. This is basically an excuse for me to hang out with friends and colleagues and riff about things that matter. Welcome to BRC and Friends. Welcome all to our second uh, webinar in this series where I'm interviewing candidates for city council. Uh, These are the first Presbyterian Church of Palo Alto webinars where uh, we engage the hearts, minds of academics and artists and authors, community leaders, folks who are doing good things in the world. Uh, Today, again, is part of our series uh, as where I'm interviewing uh, the current mayor, uh, just interviewed uh, Adrian Fine, and nine of the 10 candidates uh, for city council. Uh, These interviews, uh, hope not only to get to know the issues that are important to each of them, but also to get to know the person behind the politician. We'll be taking questions later. So if you have one, please use the Q&A feature. Uh, Derek Kikuchi is going to monitor the chat room if you have any questions technologically or anything like that. But um, I'm only going to track the Q&A section for questions later in the program. Uh, webinar uh, is being recorded and it'll be shared on our church YouTube channel as well as posted in partnership with the podcast that I host, BRC and Friends. So today uh, I welcome past mayor and candidate Pat Burt. Welcome. Good to be here. Thanks. Uh, yeah. If you could just, you know, I, I love being the new person in town. I'm like the new kid in town and I don't like know anybody. So, uh, but I do know you used to be mayor. Um, so I, I, I carry uh, with every candidate and every person I talk to, I just I'm like, oh, I get to meet a new friend. So uh, t- tell, tell me a little about yourself. Give us uh, some context, background to who you are. Who, who is Pat Burt? So I grew up around here um, in Santa Clara Valley. My parents were both teachers, uh, really renowned uh, teachers in Cupertino and and Los Altos. And um, so I I was influenced by uh, that culture. Both my sisters are teachers. And and so that whole orientation toward public service and uh, has been part of my DNA. Um, I even worked uh, in Palo Alto throughout my college career at what was then co-op market. So long-term residents will recall uh, those markets fondly. Um, And uh, my wife and I moved here in 1980 um, and rented in college, uh, uh, college terrace, a little uh, duplex, and then moved to a little cottage um, on Byron and then, ended up buying a house that my grandparents had twice rented uh, during the 1940s. My mother had actually lived in. And um, when it went on the market, uh, we just had to move there. Um, even though it needed extensive remodel, it was an old cottage, but um, our kids are able to be fourth generation uh, in this home. And, and it's a rare opportunity to have that kind of heritage. And um, so Uh, I was uh, founded uh, uh, a tech manufacturing business uh, back in the uh, early 80s and was very involved in environmental policy for 20 years and we were award winners in in, uh, sustainable manufacturing and that was a lot of my my avocation for a long while until we started having kids in the early 90s and university University South Neighborhoods uh, was forming a neighborhood organization. And I got pulled into that and really actually loved it. Um, It was a very inclusive grassroots organization focused around the redevelopment of the big, uh, what was then the Palo Alto Medical Foundation site. And so we ended up having a, uh, it was a coordinated area plan, but it was really a, a great lesson in grassroots democracy. And it was founded on principles of looking at, at 
identifying shared values first before we leaped into solutions. And the commonality of values uh, ended up being far greater than was the, the ideas that people would, would uh, assume about uh, uh, development or whatever. And out of that, we ended up having uh, a, an incredible development plan of not only a park, but a daycare center and affordable housing at the Oak Court Apartments uh, and uh, a whole bunch of wonderful community building aspects to it. Good, oh, great. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so are, are you, uh, were your kids Pally or Gun? Like what's the... Pally. So, They're so Pally, they're, right. They're, yeah. So I, I have uh, I have a senior who's at Gun. So uh, the it's it's interesting coming out of a city. There's so many schools, and there's not really these big rivalries. But you get here, and like there's the two schools, and you hear about all this history, and uh, it's 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 been quite a, a shift for us to move from kind of the the density of the city and that kind of experience into. Um, kind of return home for me. I grew up in Sacramento. And so I'm kind of now back in a little more suburban feel and vibe. And my, my kid gets to experience, you know, big suburban high school. And unfortunately, as a senior was, she was going to get to drive to school this year. And that's not happening. And no homecoming, all those. But um, so as I'm, I'm making this shift, right? So I'm new, I'm open to experiencing this new place. I've kind of committed as his pastor for a long time. Um, tell me why you love Palo Alto. I hear a lot of different reasons why people love this city. We'll, we'll get to some challenges, but certainly what, what do you love about Palo Alto when folks ask you, like, why? Why Palo Alto? For me, it was always uh, a greater sense of community than uh, most surrounding cities. Um, I mostly grew up in Sunnyvale, and um, <laughs> I, I guess I, it was, you know, it was a rapidly developed uh, more on the model that uh, of uh, urban design, of more what we have in South Palo Alto. But for me, it was somewhat of a suburban wasteland. Uh, people didn't really engage in community groups and activities. I mean, we had different things. We did, you know, kids sports and, and uh, scouting and things, but there wasn't a sense of community that we have here. Um, and for all of our imperfections, uh, Palo Alto has a great legacy of that community involvement and grassroots democracy, uh, where people engage and their voices of his, have historically mattered. Uh, there's always frustration over whether we're being listened to enough by the powers that be and, and sure. all those imperfections. But by comparison, uh, not only is there the, the, the great physical um, attractiveness of it, but it's, it's a sense of community. It's, it's placed neighborhoods that many of them that have front porches and a lot of design elements that really draw people into engaging more than elsewhere. Um, yeah. So those were many of the well, things. I, yeah. I, f I found um, in a very positive way, some people don't like to be called a small town, but uh, you know, I kind of, I, I think it's in a very positive way. In, in some ways, like my neighborhood in San Francisco, it felt like a small town in a sense because you currently ever moved out of, out of that little bubble. And it kind of feels like I'm getting to know, especially the Southern part of Palo Alto, get to know people and organizations. And um, you know, I, I did a podcast where I interviewed a bunch of the baristas from Phil's on Middlefield is just trying to get to know what's going on in that, with that generation of people. Um, I've really appreciated the, the, that kind of, small town connectedness. Somebody asked me on Sunday when I announced that I was doing these and they're like, oh my gosh, how did you get all the candidates to agree? And I said, well, I asked. Like, <laughs> it's like, and you know, in, in, in San Francisco that might've happened a little bit only because I've been active, but it wasn't like a new person could walk into San Francisco and be like, hey, I'd love for you to come on our webinar with our church and you're gonna get all candidates to come on. So. There, I, I echo that that's much of what we've experienced um, about living in Palo Alto. But um, so let me ask you, you know, you mentioned some of the little things like what, what do you think are going to be some of the, the collective challenges for the community? What do you see as you're, you're moving back into um, public service in an elected form? Like what do you see as the challenges uh, coming forward for the community? Well, we have, an unexpected set of challenges on top of the ones that we were 
already anticipating and have been there a long while. And so the, the unexpected, of course, is both the public health and the ensuing economic uh, emergency and crisis that we're facing, uh, both in the private sector in our community, uh, but in city government, which is how we deliver all the services that in normal times we tend to take for granted the role of local government. But it's suddenly everybody realizes, oh, wait a minute, that's where my libraries and parks and all the teen and youth services and uh, uh, public safety and, and emergency response and, in our case, uh, clean water, clean electricity, uh, they all come from local government. And suddenly people are saying, well, uh, maybe this matters more to me. And then on top of that, even uh, with the, the national political climate, that people are understanding the importance of local government for, uh, for social justice and uh, a whole myriad of uh, ways that matters on the national level. Um, aside from those newer uh, uh, priorities, we have had this uh, huge uh, debate and challenge on the, the transformation that's been happening from the, uh, the explosive growth that we've had over the last decade up until now. And uh, how do we balance the issues of, of uh, uh, job growth with uh, housing and housing for diverse uh, incomes and the transportation challenges and others, uh, the infrastructure needs that go along with that. And so that was the, has been the most uh, difficult and contentious issue for a long while. And then the third major area that I've been deeply involved with is environmental issues. Um, and it, it really ties in with the second one. And, Ultimately, it's about how do we have a sustainable uh, city and region where environmentally, economically, and socially, future generations are able to have comparable opportunities to what we've had. Um, and, uh, and certainly today, climate change is, is central to that, uh, that challenge. Yeah. So tell me, um, let's just uh, move into some of that. I, 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 I'm giving all the candidates the you know, same slate of, qu slate of questions, but, uh, but also just want to talk about since you kind of moved us into the climate change conversation, I know Palo Alto is really trying to take the lead on this and being a city that um, uh, I forget what year we're trying to get to clean. But um, tell me a little bit of how, as you get, if you say you get elected, like around climate change, what are you going to be focused on? What are you going to be pushing on? What are you supporting? Uh, I know a lot of folks in our congregation are involved with Cool Planet, and there is going to be a forum particularly on climate change. So we won't spend a lot of time, but tell, tell me a little bit about where you're headed with climate change. So uh, the, the goal that you alluded to is uh, our, in our uh, sustainability and climate action plan, which we adopted in our, our version 2016, is called an 80-30 goal. So it's 80% reduction from the 1990 baseline um, by 2030, an extremely ambitious goal. And unfortunately, uh, the last three plus years, uh, we've fallen behind on uh, our pace of progress. Uh, when I was last on the council, we made some huge uh, advancements, which actually laid the groundwork for such a reach goal, uh, because that's one of the most aggressive goals uh, anywhere uh, globally. Um, so we had actually uh, in 2015, uh, initiated 2014, in 2015 we were one of the first cities internationally to have 100% carbon neutral electricity. And we did that because we had started a foundation a, a, a decade before, uh, more aggressive than even the state on renewable energy uh, portfolio. We expanded it. Um, interestingly, uh, we, we had a battle in about 2012 with our staff who said cost of renewables were going up and we had to uh, buy into some renewables that we were surprised were even properly categorized as renewable. And several of us on the council battled staff and refused to accept the recommendations, which was a blow up at the time. And they oh, said, sure. you're never going to get there. 
And um, instead, uh, the path that we thought would occur, but we didn't have certainty, is the cost of renewables then began a downward uh, uh, drop uh, fantastically, and it continues to this day. And we were able to go from a target of 33% renewables plus 45% hydro, which the state doesn't categorize as renewable, uh, to actually, for the same budget, get to 100% carbon neutral electricity within just a few years more. And we did it at a third. All around the world, poverty is stealing choices from kids. It's time to give those choices back. Introducing Chosen, World Vision's new invitation to sponsorship. For the first time, kids have the power to choose their own sponsors. Now the choice is theirs. The choice to take hold of their future. And even the choice to step into a life-changing relationship with you. Learn more at worldvision.org slash chosen. Lower costs than PG&E charges uh, our surrounding um, uh, communities. Mm -hmm. So their dirtier electricity at one third higher cost than us. <laughs> so that was well the done. foundation. Yeah. Well done, council. At, at that. Uh, I, I won't ask you to comment on whether the council since then has done a good job or not, but uh, definitely want to continue to move on. So um, I, as I said, I, I sent out a bunch of questions that I'm asking everybody, but I also want to give a chance to have everybody talk about what they're excited about and their passion. So um, the first question, we're going to start with the real easy one. I tell everybody we're an easy one. Let's talk about institutional racism and policing. Um, and there's a lot of movements out there, you know, where George, what's the George Floyd um, kind of uh, social uprisings going to happen and, and continuing all over. Uh, I was just at an event last yesterday in Palo Alto, a Black Lives Matter gathering. Um, and so there's a lot of passions, energies, ideas. Um, I certainly have my opinions where our church does all the kind of things, but I want to get to know about what you all are thinking. Um, so I want to talk and you know, ask you a little bit about um, how you see um, inst institutional racism, particularly in Palo Alto, like how do we address it? What do you assess it as? And then let's talk about policing. And there's a lot of ways to think about it, reform, to defund, to abolish, and just to, we'll talk a little bit about where you stand on those and um, how you see our um, policing in, in Palo Alto. Let's talk about the first thing, just um, as things have been uh, lifted up in our country and uh, in front of us, I think we've been given permission to talk about these things differently and folks have been willing to step into spaces that maybe weren't willing before, but what, what do you think of this nature of uh, institutional racism or racism in Palo Alto in government and services? I mean, just kind of muse on this a little bit for us. Let, let folks know kind of how, where, where you stand on, on this thinking. Well, I, I put two reference points. Um, what we yet need to do, and where we have been in a historic context. So in the first one, in the historic context, uh, I think we all have to look at the evolution that has occurred and continues to happen and the greater awareness and hopefully um, uh, the bending curve of, of, of justice. And uh, Palo Alto for its own flaws historically uh, was ahead of most of the communities in our, our region uh, in adopting uh, more progressive practices. Joseph Eichler was basically broke the, uh, the uh, covenant uh, of racist covenants that had been uh, adopted and was a, a groundbreaker. And, and he was centered here in Palo Alto. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that was frankly, one of the, the distinguishing characteristics of Palo Alto in the 50s and 60s. Um, and, uh, but then we had the legacy of what had happened before then, and we still have that to this day. But today, it's not um, a legacy of racist intentions. It's a legacy of, of um, economics where we have uh, uh, economic barriers to the diversity that we would like to have. Uh, when I headed the University South Neighborhoods Group and we did the, uh, that area planning, it was the neighborhood that insisted on affordable housing in that project, along with affordable housing advocates. But our neighborhood wanted to not only have affordable housing, but we didn't want it to be inward directed like many uh, affordable housing projects. We wanted it to be 
uh, look similar to the homes in the community, to face outward and engage, and the community to have a relationship uh, with affordable housing residents. So I think that reflects the value structure. It's a great challenge to go the rest of the way. And what we've had even since then is even more uh, economic gentrification, which makes it even harder uh, to achieve what we would like. But I think most Palo Altans, actually their orientation, they would like to have greater diversity. And in particular, our, our lack of diversity today is uh, with uh, black and Hispanic communities uh, because of the yep. economics. We now are one third Asian in our community, uh, yep. but we have uh, a lower black and Hispanic population in the region. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a... I think that is where the crux at now for a lot of communities where we we intellectually, emotionally, like at our gut, we want to be more diverse, but then to actually maybe do the things that are going to bring that about, feel like we're giving something, like we're going to have to give something up. And so how do you frame change in a way that's not a zero sum game, right? It's, this is about we gain something when we're more diverse, even if it feels like you might be losing something in some other place. What, what are the trade-offs that are worth it? Um, so, you know, I think uh, what, what I, I know um, part of the conversation has been happening with the city council and uh, the human rights commission and all those is talking about the police and policing in Palo Alto, but policing in general. I mean, there's, there's theor- lots of ideological theoretical conversations happening around the roots of policing and what needs to happen. Um, but I know that one of the p- things we, is being pushed through right now or it, supported by many is uh, the eight can't wait uh, for the police department and apparently police seem to be um, uh, in leaning towards signing that. I don't know where, the, where they are now. And there, there are some who feel like that's not enough and all those kind of things. How, how do you understand policing? Would love to know in a big picture. And then how do you see policing uh, in Palo Alto um, moving forward? What does that begin to look like for you? So um, I'll answer both the, the policy standpoint and how I perceive our existing policing. Uh, from the existing policing, we've had um, several really troublesome incidents in the last couple of years that have caused us to have uh, a, a, a refocus. And these occurred, and we were many of us were aware of them even before uh, the current uh, yeah. rejuvenation of the Black Lives Matter movement. And so those were those were disconcerting and made us question what's wrong with with what we thought was um, an exceptional police force, actually. And many people in that field will say, Palo Alto has one of the best police forces anywhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yet we've had incidents that just uh, almost undeniably uh, show that we still have problems. So the eight can't wait uh, is a, a really excellent uh, set of reforms. It's not the totality of what we need. Um, but it's really, they're not extreme measures. Uh, they've been adopted by cities. They're, the county has already, in the last few months, adopted them in principle. Um, there, were, there are a few nuances that I think are legitimate to debate, uh, where the police uh, department and union say, well, here is why this specific wording is problematic and maybe a different uh, suggestion is or uh, is appropriate, but that's on the margins. Uh, Fundamentally, I think we're in the direction that we're going to be adopting those. The other element though is uh, things that get tied in with this um, mantra of defund police. And I think that that's an unfortunate, uh, essentially uh, descriptor of of a direction that we uh, should be thinking more about and acting on, but it's a, it's, Politically, it's, I think, a bad way to describe it. But what that is about is we, we still have um, armed uniformed police officers who are required by our own current systems to be the bodies that respond to mental health issues that are nonviolent or domestic disputes that are nonviolent for homeless issues and things like that. And in, there are models that have been established, they're not yet the norm, but in different cities, where those functions go to mental health professionals who work with the police, 
uh, but they're the point person on those um, those calls. Uh, and uh, same thing on social workers. Uh, Eugene, Oregon has what's for 30 plus years now, the CAHOOTS program that has yep. outsourced this. Um, interestingly, as in the last few months, I discussed these issues with a number of people that I've known either retired from the, our police department or still involved, our, our pastor who is uh, an East Palo Alto minister, Reverend Paul Baines, and really asked about you know, what, what their thoughts were on both of those areas, the can't wait and these things. And I was surprised to find out that before our last budget cut from the crisis, we had already, before this program, had uh, budgeted in a social uh, uh, worker to take on uh, a number of those emergency response calls as the first point of contact. So that whole direction is one that should be done, but it ties in with the financial crisis too. And how do we allocate the right resources for that? Although once those transitions have been made, they, there's a good argument that that's more cost effective as well than oh, yeah. very expensive uh, sworn uh, police officers. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, I will leave a little bit. I, you know, I think uh, so San Francisco is an eight can't wait city and it doesn't help. I, I, I would just, I just want to, I, I think I'm one of those that feels like it is uh, sometimes if, even if we get there, it almost is. An, um, I wouldn't want us to kind of then ease off, right. To begin to think that that's all that's going to happen. And yeah. Do you mean uh, doesn't help or doesn't solve the problem? Uh, I would say both. I mean, our San Francisco Police Department is, has been, um, because I think it gave us, it has gives somewhat of a false sense of security or a false sense of h- how folks are going to be treated. So I, I just think it's a, it's, it, there's a lot of debate about eight can't wait um, within a lot of black communities as well as abolition communities and things. So it's, it's something that um, I appreciate that, the, the movement's happening, but um, would would also encourage folks. And I'll I'll say this to all the candidates. I mean, I think just to 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 look at how a can't wait is perceived in a lot of spaces isn't it's it's more seen as a reform as a way for it's it's often seen or sometimes seen I'll say uh, as a way to to not quite do enough. And so um, you know I, I'm. I'm kind of staying out of the, I'm the new guy. And so I'm staying out of the particulars of it in, in our political arena, but um, it is something that I'm pretty passionate about these days. Uh, so appreciate that. And I do, I, I echo um, uh, the defund movement. Well, it doesn't bother me as much. I, I know that that has been a, a critique of using the, the language of that, that, how do we shift our, the ways in which we engage spending. I will say that um, while I still think it's a high percentage, uh, Palo Alto is pretty low percentage compared to other cities of what we spend on our police department. I think it's 19% or something as opposed to San Francisco, which is 40 plus or something. I can't remember what it is exactly, but all right, let's move on. Let's get on to cheerier topics of, uh, uh, let me let me ask you about, um, uh, about affordable housing. Cause I know nobody cares about that here in Palo Alto and nobody has any passions about housing going on here. Uh, so what's your, what's your vision of affordable housing? How do you, um, and, and those of you that are watching this, I, I we're going to take, I know that there's a questions already coming in the Q and a, I'm going to take those uh, at, after we kind of do all these main questions. So I'll get to them. So Kelsey, I will ask your question. Uh, but what is, uh, what does affordable housing look like for you? Uh, what, what, what are you supporting? What are you pushing? Uh, what, what's, what's the vision of affordable housing in Palo Alto f- uh, from your perspective? Well, first, we, we've been ahead of other communities uh, and for, long, for decades in this. Um, we have over 2,000 subsidized housing units in our community. We probably haven't done a very good job of making sure that particularly residents who have uh, joined us in the last decade or so uh, really knowing that history. Uh, But just in the first Presbyterian neighborhood, we're sort of place, 801 uh, Alma, some really very large and significant affordable housing projects. They're probably most successful if we don't even realize they're there. Uh, They're part of unity. And then we have inclusionary housing where larger developments have a percentage there. The problem going forward is that um, the funding for affordable housing is really grossly inadequate for um, the greater need that we have now than we did before. Because um, uh, the Bay Area Council, for instance, did a study a few years ago for each new high-tech job, 4.3 other jobs are generated. 
And for the most part, those are lower income jobs. They're either moderate income or low income. And in Palo Alto, moderate income jobs does not allow um, uh, you to afford housing here. And so, and we don't have a mechanism to build moderate income housing. We've actually had greater problems building that than we even have on the affordable and we have problems on both. So we have several different dials that we're able to turn. Uh, we're able to do zoning incentives, which uh, just two years ago, we had some very major changes in zoning to streamline and upzone for affordable housing. And we just got one project through that occurred uh, in, in part because of those zoning changes on El Camino Wilton Court. Um, so zoning changes, we can do more. There's also a problem where uh, affordable housing has to compete with the value of land for office and things. Uh, and so we, in my mind, we need to eliminate in certain locations that competition where we make housing as the only uh, development that's allowed in some of these areas. And then we have the funding. And so we get it from impact fees from uh, commercial development and uh, market rate housing. And then we get it from... Um, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. Oh, that's a chair we used to do in softball. Uh, what? It's uh, actually Geico. Whenever someone hit a triple, we would wave our bats and yell, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. But we never got to use it because we would only hit home runs. Annoying. The phrase is from Geico because they help save people money? Geico? Yeah, they were our team sponsor. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. When you have a problem, Box 12 gets you answers. The violence continues. When crime hits too close to home, we want to make sure your voice is heard. We're listening and ready to confront your problems head on. How can Box 12 help you? Tell us at kptv.com. Uh, other funding sources or potentially. You, you come from San Francisco. Uh, I led a charge over the last few years to attempt to have a business tax in Palo Alto a third of that would be toward affordable housing. And that would, at a quarter the rate of what San Francisco charges in business, we could triple our rate of affordable housing here. Mm -hmm. So it's about funding if we really are serious about it. And we right. hear a lot of refrains and about not compounding the problem. So if Palo Alto continued, was continuing on their previous path, which we've stopped a massive office growth, then our need for affordable housing escalates uh, and we just dig a deeper hole. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's funny, uh, you know, um, one of my kids, you know, got a job in Palo Alto and minimum wage is great. And she's like, yeah, it's great. I'm like, well, it's great if you're in high school, like it's, it's like super awesome. But if you're tr trying to make a living, I mean, a lot of her, her coworkers were 20 and 30 year olds driving from other places and would, and I would talking about, you know, living wage and all those kind of things. I mean, it's a, uh, it, it's it's a shame that more folks who work in Palo Alto and come here and enjoy the city and can't actually live here. Um, I know some of the questions around affordable housing have been architecture and you know traffic and all those kind of things. I mean, what are you what are you hearing in terms of um, what are the arguments? Again, I think everybody would say yes, we want more affordable housing, but then. Like, how do we do it? What are the arguments against some of the things that you're pushing? Like, what are, what are the folks saying to you? It's like, no, we don't want to do this because. Like, what are, what are you hearing out there? What, what's the pushback? Well, so there'll be initial pushbacks. And um, one of the faults that I have seen by affordable housing advocates is that they want to say, we're on the right side of, of justice. And therefore, any concerns by anybody else are illegitimate. And instead of uh, having that value-based discussion that I talked about before, and, uh, and then sitting down and understanding, well, what are your concerns? So we had this Wilton Court project on El Camino, which was over half uh, disabled adults. Um, and in many communities, there'd be hesitancy to uh, have that kind of a project for various apprehensive regions, reasons. And that neighborhood, Ventura neighborhood, which has historically been our most diverse neighborhood in Palo Alto, um, uh, that community actually uh, was embracing of the concept of an affordable project and meeting those social needs. And they didn't have any problems with that. They were having problems with cut through traffic that the city wasn't dealing with. And a couple of 
minor architectural issues. We ended up sitting down and, and they were going to uh, not be able to support that project. Uh, and a couple of us sat down and facilitated that. And within weeks, uh, uh, the uh, Palo Alto Housing Corp and they came to uh, reconciliation and on with just minor changes. And they became supporters, enthusiastic supporters of that project. And they were so glad that that other issues were able to be resolved because they wanted to support it. It's not the other. So I had the same discussion with Joe Samidian, our county supervisor, as a similar philosophy to mine, is that if we simply sit down and engage in problem solving, we almost invariably uh, will get community support around the affordable housing project. If we just try to ram it down folks' throats, they'll rebel even over little things uh, or things that many of us mm -hmm. don't think are big obstacles. Um, right. But that's been my experience and the experience of several yeah. others. Well, I mean, that's any, any social change, right? You, have, you do have folks that are kind of pushing, got to push the edges for then some of, some of us who might be able to kind of be in that middle bridging conversation and to bring along the folks who were a little more resistant. I mean, I, I kind of have always been like, I, I, need, I need the people in my life to kind of push out a little bit. Otherwise, I might not like step into that space as easily. But yet I can hold a space that's maybe a little bit more relational um, and, and all, I mean, I kind of think all of those are needed in, in many ways. So that, that's helpful. That's, that's really good. Let me ask you a little bit about um, uh, faith community in, in Palo Alto. I've heard from uh, Mayor, Mayor Fine last said he's never seen the faith community be quite as active as it has been lately. I don't know how much that's been true or if that's just, you know, I know historically it has been, but what do you see as the faith community's life in Palo Alto and, and, and um, how can we be helpful uh, in some of the things that you might be thinking um, about the future of our city? Well, I think actually um, the faith community has been historically more active than Mayor Fine realizes. Um, mm -hmm. And, but I think that um, it has not been in as great of a leadership role uh, in recent decades as it can be. And I think that the a couple of times where it would uh, uh, elements of it would would say, well, we need to get more engaged. And it a couple of times it would be, well, we've decided what the outcomes ought to be, and what we have to do is is force those upon the community. And I think that's a real misguided approach. I think the the role of the faith community is around uh, building a, a value based consensus that appealing to our, our better sides as a community and, and bringing out what I think is actually sometimes a latent uh, set of progressive values that we're not reflecting on adequately about uh, how to fulfill those values locally and that the faith community can have a real leadership role in that. I had wanted to create a, an organization the last couple of years and we may yet um, uh, that might be called Palo Alto Together, but would bring together not only the faith community, but a whole set of community partners that are very, uh, it's, a, it's a rich set of community partners who are uh, uh, committed to um, living up to our potential as a community. And the faith community, sh I think, could and should be at the center of that. But not to step forward with um, the outcomes that they've decided in advance and impose them, but to lead a moral discussion and a value-based discussion in the community. And I think out of that, uh, we'll then get the progress. Yeah. Well, good luck with that. <laughs> I mean, most, most, most right. faith communities, right? I mean, in some ways, I would say yes to, to most of ish what you're saying, but I mean, I think there is an element of, of we come to faith in that and, 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 some choose not to be involved politically, right? That's just not something that they see as the role of their communities and 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 I think are, are somewhat safe, right? I mean, kind of absorb the culture around and then there are others that are pushing out to have a moral voice, which is kind of a decision about where we should head. So, I mean, I think I agree with you around how we might do that, but at the same time, I think faith communities should be able to claim some kind of um, kind of moral space that we're occupying from a particular perspective. Um, not well, that everybody so, has to have it. Yeah. 
So the moral yeah. space is what I was talking about. Yeah. I'm talking about uh, uh, leaping into a conversation with uh, predeterminations of how to translate that moral position into specific development outcomes or whatever political outcomes. I think that the, it's about leading as opposed to imposing. Yeah. And I think that the, we have a vacuum in that leadership, in that moral leadership. And I think through that, uh, the community will live up to its, its uh, uh, greater uh, 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 potential. Good. I'd love to see. I mean, I know that they've come, uh, at the, the interfaith folks have come together around certain issues or their things that are happening. I know I, I, I often have heard about the, when the, uh, the mobile, mobile home park, uh, that was, there was a big debate about that. And then there's stuff about, um, RVs and just lots of things where they've been more issue based. And I know there are certain folks who are engaged in some, I mean, you have Coloma who's on the, um, on the Human Rights Commission now. Um, so, I mean, I, it's, it's, um, it would be great to see more integration of the ver variety of faith communities that here are here. So um, let's move on. So let me just, this is a very broad question, and then we'll go to your question and answer folks who are watching uh, this right now. Uh, so what is your vision for Palo Alto in five or 10 years? You can choose. Like, what, lay that out for us. Five, 10 years from now, what, what does Palo Alto look like? Well, I, I don't think it'll look radically different physically. Um, and I think it, um, it will continue on an evolutionary process. The question is, which one? Um, is it one that is uh, principally focused on uh, the material successes and the affluence of our business community and us privately in the community? Or is it one that is more focused on... Um, uh, a sense of the community we want to live in um, and uh, whether it, it is moving toward fulfilling uh, our values. And so this goes back to the things we've been talking about. Are, is it one where we are willing to do the things to create greater diversity, even while we're struggling against uh, economic trends toward greater gentrification? Is it one where we... Um, we care about the, the, the livability and, and the focus of the community, that, that people who live here are thinking uh, not predominantly about uh, how to become more affluent. Uh, we certainly understand the ambition and the, the great skills and abilities of, of much of our community, uh, but we are more focused as a community on uh, the human qualities of where we live and how we relate to one another. Um, so I think that uh, we have that potential to recalibrate in that direction. Um, and that's what I, I want to work to do. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We're going to take questions from uh, folks in the audience. Um, uh, I'm going to, add, I'm going to not quite go in order because I think some of these might be a little bit uh, quicker. So I'm going to uh, ask Margaret Fiddler's question. I'm going to read them because we're recording this. And so folks who are watching this later get the question, but um, Pat, you can see these as well. But uh, for Margaret Fiddler, what do you favor for the Fry's site? Any chance we could get lots of housing instead of a big box store, adding traffic and parking issues and adding jobs and housing uh, and ha housing imbalance. So talk about the fry site. Brass yeah. tax, what I get, and this is like, what's going on at this particular block? Yeah, well, it's not just a block, it's a whole- <laughs> That's scenario. true. That's <laughs> yeah, and so it has a lot of potential. Um, it's a, what's called a coordinated area plan that we're doing to, to do a, a long range uh, planning for a, a, a very significant area. Um, yeah, I, I'm concerned that the, uh, proposal by Sobrato that has come forward, uh, is not only for, uh, retaining a retail function, they want to put in a small target store where fries had been, but that they want to couple that with retaining or even expanding the offices that are there. Uh, that site, the city council in the 1990s had <laughs> amortized the commercial functions and said, this is zoned for future housing. We'll give you 20 mm. years to get there. And uh, in the uh, late 2000s, the council reversed that and put on hold that whole uh, amortization. And I think that was a, a bad mistake. I was on the planning commission and voted against that. Um, so now um, 
the owners of the site are uh, treating it as if they have an entitlement to the commercial uses over the housing and say, well, we don't really have a, um, the housing doesn't pencil out right now, et cetera. Uh, the city can and should um, rezone that for what we want it to be. And if it's to be a combination of retail and housing, I'm open to that. But I don't think it should be um, uh, really an office uh, location. And so we can have significant housing there. Uh, there's a proposal by the neighborhood. Interestingly, yeah. a lot of neighborhood activists are proposing that the city buy it for affordable yeah. housing. And so uh, that's another reflection of kind of what are actually the community values they prefer. And they've had the surveys that have been done in that neighborhood. They said, we most of all want low and moderate income housing there, least of all high income housing. That's a right. value statement of this community. Sure. Contrary to a lot of assertions that uh, we hear from a few folks. Sure, sure. So will that, um, is that decision going to be made uh, this term or will that be part of your term should you be elected? Um, I suspect it'll roll over into the next council. Mm -hmm. That's pretty important. I mean, yeah. that's, that's a significant thing. All right. Thank you, Margaret, for that. Um, I'm not going to ask two from you, Margaret, because we do have to want to be fair. Uh, let's go back up to Kelsey Bain. So Kelsey, your question is a single family only in R1 house zoning is linked to racial segregation and 87% of the residential land in Palo Alto is zoned R1. Do you support changing zoning to legalize more inclusive housing options, duplexes, triplexes, cottage clusters, courtyard apartments on our residential land. You've spoken to this a little bit, but do you want to go ahead and answer that for Kelsey? Yeah. So we have, uh, we have our broader citywide uh, need to expand the housing. And then uh, the issue she's talking about of our, what were historically single family neighborhoods. Uh, we actually no longer have single family neighborhoods. Uh, we now have gone from uh, a second unit, uh, ADUs, which used to be called granny units or whatever, secondary units, smaller units, which the city drastically liberalized uh, a couple of years ago. And we went from um, oh, nine or 10 a year to 75 a year in the most recent year, a huge increase in, in those number of units. And over uh, a 10 year period, that's, that's a significant amount. Now the, the council is just solidifying uh, allowing a second uh, unit, uh, what's called a junior ADU, which is carve out a portion within a house for a second. So any home in Palo Alto can now have essentially three different residence, uh, hmm. residences located there. Uh, there's a new movement uh, that Kelsey's referring to, which is to basically uh, eliminate all semblance of uh, single family zoning anywhere. Uh, statewide. And it would mandate that all single family lots could be divided in two. And then each of those additional lots could have two additional ADUs. So an existing lot would have six ADUs. This is on the fall, follow on to a proposal by uh, State Senator Scott Weiner, SB 50, mm -hmm. which basically had said uh, you'd have uh, anywhere in Palo Alto, four unit uh, apartment buildings, but within a half mile of any regular transit, 10 to 20 unit apartment buildings next to, uh, in the middle of single family neighborhoods with zero parking. And I just don't think that's either necessary. I don't think it's good planning. Uh, and, um, and I don't think it's uh, the right thing to do. I think we can have um, really important measures to address our housing issues uh, without saying we're going to essentially abolish and deliberately destroy the, the, the basic character of most neighborhoods. All right. I'm sure that uh, there's a lot of debate about that uh, as, as we can, as we hear. Um, I'll ask one more housing question from Evan. Uh, senior housing project got stopped some years ago by referendum, he thinks. I don't, I don't, obviously don't know. Affordable housing seems a harder sell probably. Uh, have we changed enough to make approval by voters possible? Um, public opinion, is it moving more towards affordable housing and might that bring in more diverse black Hispanic residents, do you think? I mean, again, we've, we've danced around this, but I mean, go ahead. Go yeah. yeah, one more time. So one, I agree that the, the, the real only way that we're going to have that uh, social and economic diversity with uh, black and Hispanic residents is through uh, subsidizing moderate and low income housing. And, um, and that needs funding and it needs that zoning to do it. Um, 
uh, the sort of uh, housing that Kelsey was talking about, the, the advocates of that have, have argued that that would somehow mean that we'd get diversity in the single family neighborhoods. And if you look at the economics of it, having new market rate luxury housing on smaller lots is not going to change uh, the affordability. It's we need to have deliberate government programs that help do that. And, and it, it's, it's a different model than what we used to have. Uh, it's now needing to be more fundamental to our, our growth going forward. So we did have one project uh, that was overturned by the voters um, uh, seven years ago. I was a big supporter of the project, although I was critical of the process. And once again, it was one where advocates kind of rammed it down the throats of a neighborhood and we had a backlash and one that we re regretted at the time and, um, and still to this day, it's something that uh, has kind of branded us as a community over that one opposition. Um, but part of that was that it was a, a real kind of disdain for any concern of, of the neighborhood. Um, and that was, that was a senior, was, that was a senior housing project? Yeah, it was a senior housing project coupled with a market rate housing component. Ah, okay. And the actual, the objection was the market rate housing component, uh, but the two were coupled uh, together inextricably. Um, sure. And um, yeah, so I, I, I thought the, the referendum was a mistake, but I also thought that the way it was approached was uh, brought that on, unfortunately. I supported the project in the end, but, um, right. but I, I think we could have been successful with it. All right. Uh, just a couple more uh, uh, from Leif Erickson, who I'm, I'm sure you know Leif is awesome. Thank you for your voice as a citizen during, as a citizen, now you're just a citizen, uh, as uh, for the resident of the budget debates, especially about the right balance between cuts to community services versus capital programs. How are you now seeing those budget issues in the continuing economic challenges? So what Leaf's talking about is in this uh, budget crisis, uh, we had this year scheduled an all-time record infrastructure budget and the capital budget, uh, twice the level that we had ever had before. I was very involved in coming up with a funding program and a long-term plan for what was uh, an, uh, uh, a huge backlog in infrastructure needs. This year, we had a crash in revenue, principally from our hotels, uh, the greatest crash, and that was the revenue source that we had dedicated to the infrastructure. Hmm. So that source crashed, and the city staff, with uh, a narrow majority of the council going along, decided instead to slash the community services uh, instead of modest cuts to the capital program. Uh, that's still going forward. They tweaked it a little bit in the budget process. Um, uh, they're going to next meet on the budget in October. Um, I think that the community is uh, strongly opposed to what the staff and the council decisions were, and that we mm -hmm. should at this point in time uh, be putting people first and not projects and big infrastructure construction. We'll get back to that when the economy normalizes. And frankly, we didn't need to cut it very much at all, just a modest mm -hmm. reduction. So they had initially proposed to in the middle of this pandemic with all the impacts on youth to zero out completely eliminate all teen programs in the city now we fought back and we were able to restore that uh, uh, for the most part uh, but we still have drastic cuts um, and we had other cuts to public safety even emergency services department was cut so that we could build a new police building it yeah. just makes no sense and um, and so I'm still fighting that battle uh, and uh, we'll have another opportunity to try and influence the council in October. And then hopefully if that, if that doesn't happen, we'll have a new council in, in January and we'll be able to adjust. Now, frankly, though, we don't know whether our, our budget will get worse by then, right. get better right. or as projected. So we might, yeah. uh, we just don't know what adjustments we'll yeah. have to make. So, I, and I assume the hotel crash that you talked about was because of pandemic. Correct. Yeah. And we had yeah. devoted yeah. those resources to the infrastructure. Yeah, yeah. Well, yes, uh, uh, I heard quite a bit from Leaf about the, uh, obviously Leaf is incredibly passionate about youth services. And so um, we're, we're ecstatic to hear that, all, that it, it happened in a positive, as positive as possible. Um, I'm gonna squeeze Margaret's last question in. Do you favor a particular solution for rail crossing challenges? Um, 
I, I'm not yet at a point of narrowing it to a particular solution, uh, but I'll tell you the, the ones that I'm most intrigued with are two that actually came out of the community despite city staff and the city manager insisting that uh, there were no other alternatives and the, we didn't need the real community input. And now the most promising ones were, were generated in concept by community members have now been flushed out at a moderate degree. And so they're kind of uh, at Churchill, it's a partial closure. Um, right. And down at Charleston East Meadow, it's, uh, it has to do with a roundabout and a new uh, approach there. Um, we don't have enough information yet to be certain that those are the right ones. Those are the ones that look most appealing to me. Uh, right. We have real, our grade crossings are exceptionally challenging because we have a, a very narrow right of way and housing uh, and Alma virtually abutting it. So we have yep. no wiggle room, and I, I knew it was going to be a tough uh, challenge, but uh, I like the progress that the community group has done. It is another example of how empowering a community group in Palo Alto is really part of what I think is both the DNA of the community and utilizing just the, the, the great resources that we have in our citizenry, as opposed to stiff arming them and saying all good ideas must come from consultants and staff. And I've just never experienced it. Uh, we have a lot of bright people. Uh, now, sometimes it can be a disadvantage. The joke is we, we have 65,000 people and 70,000 opinions in Palo Alto. Uh, but yes. that's democracy. You know, we, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we'll, we'll narrow that down, hopefully, to a reasonable number. Well, and I, I kind of think that's our region of, of, you know, progressive is such a weird word, but generally progressive values of wanting to hear people's voices. I mean, I think that that core element is in a lot of cities around here and it's a pain, right? But yet that's what we do. So I, I totally agree with you. All right, we're gonna shift towards the end now. You have any questions for me? I always wanna give an opportunity to folks of anybody, you don't have to, but um, as I am got to sit and ask you questions for the last almost hour, do you have no, any? I was, I, I was interested in kind of, as, as someone who's been here a year, what your perceptions were and you really shared some of those at the beginning and off <laughs> camera. And I, I, that, no, that was, I, I valued that. So, and, yeah, and, it's, and it's particularly important to hear a frame of reference of someone who comes to the community now versus somebody who's been here for a decade or several decades. And we're still thinking in past perceptions that may or may not be how somebody views us when they, they, they arrive. But some of my greatest conversations have been with the members of the congregation who I've, I've just kind of, and like I've committed to this church for the long haul. So it's not like I'm carpet bagging through, right? I mean, I just, I'm going to be here. And so I'm like, okay, so here's what I'm experiencing. And I know that that, that almost conflicts with this ideal that we may, we may have or what you even had or whatever. And I think it's been really folks have been like, huh? Yeah. I mean, it's seeing things through, through brand new eyes uh, to, to, and through the eyes of someone who's, co who's committed to be here. Like, I'm, again, I'm, I'm here for at least a decade. Um, you know, it's been, it's been actually quite lovely to have some of these conversations. All right, I'm going to ask you my last three questions that I ask everybody. What are you reading? What are you watching? And what are you listening to? Oh, uh, speed dating, huh? Yeah, uh, exactly. <laughs> So um, reading um, a couple books, uh, one's called Strong Towns, which is how to really look at uh, reinvigorating uh, communities, towns and cities, according to mm -hmm. rebuilding uh, uh, values and infrastructure and all that really make communities uh, positive. Uh, another book is called Winners, Winners Take All. I don't know if you've heard of it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a critique of... Um, of how um, kind of the, the elite, uh, the tech elite and otherwise uh, have claimed that their, their mission is to change the world in a positive way and, and it's a critique of, of uh, that claim. Mm -hmm. uh, what am I watching? Uh, too much uh, cable news. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. for most of us probably. <laughs> yeah. Um, are, you, are you binging any shows? Like, are you like, this, yeah, this I is had the time. A, a few different ones. I'm trying to think uh, uh, what, but I've run out of time. And especially with the <laughs> campaign now, I, I just have to <laughs> shut it down. Unfortunately, the campaign's cut into the cable news. Uh, binging. That's probably, that's probably yeah. a good thing. It's probably a good um, thing. I think. <laughs> let's see on uh, what I listen to a combination of music. Um, I, I'm a blues and reggae fan. Okay. Um, and, and actually I've been listening to more of it recently. Um, um, 
just it, it's been something I needed to do and get back yeah. to that. I was I was just um, I have a new artist um, that as we were we have a, my campaign kickoff tomorrow and we were looking for some music and um, and I wanted to um, have a, a version of uh, Van Morrison's Brand New Day, um, but by uh, Miriam Makiba. I don't know if you ever heard of her. Mm -hmm. uh, so she was the grand dame of South African uh, liberation music, uh, really a jazz singer, uh, contemporary of Mandela and uh, uh, very famous artist throughout Africa. And she did a great version of that song. And oh. I just, I fell in love with it. Is that, is that kicking off a campaign or dirt? No. Uh, so okay. um, <laughs> no, I'm closing with, um, um, uh, Richie Haven's uh, version of Here Comes the Sun. I don't know if okay. you know it. Yep. Uh, yep, you, sure. yep. It's great. And uh, okay. lyrics are right. We're kind of looking at how do we how do we emerge from our present crisis? All right. Well, good luck on that ki kickoff. And I know this is just a um, I've been involved in my mom worked for the state legislature for 25 years. I've been involved in campaigns for my entire life. It's oh, such I a strange you. Strange time for everyone, for sure. All right. Uh, thanks all for joining us today. We're out of time. Uh, please be sure to register for all the other webinars with the candidates. I have eight more to go. So I appreciate Pat kind of leading this off this way. Uh, you can connect with Pat on Twitter and Instagram at Pat Burt PA. And then you can connect with me on all the uh, social media platforms at B Reyes Chow. Uh, please be sure to follow and connect with First Presbyterian Church on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at FPC Palo Alto. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, you can just search First Presbyterian Church Palo Alto. You can find all that. Thanks to Derek Kikuchi for helping out again on the webinar. And thank you, Pat, for sitting down with me today. Thank you. Yeah. All right, all. Thanks for being here. And we'll uh, see you at the next webinar. BRC and Friends was produced, written, recorded, and edited by Bruce Reyes Chow with zero help from his dog Vespa. Please be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to BRC and Friends wherever you listen to podcasts. Also, please follow, like, tag, and share on all the platforms via BRC A N D F R I E N D S. Thanks for listening to BRC and Friends. All around the world, poverty is stealing choices from kids. It's time to give those choices back. Introducing Chosen, World Vision's new invitation to sponsorship. For the first time, kids have the power to choose their own sponsors. Now the choice is theirs. The choice to take hold of their future. And even the choice to step into a life-changing relationship with you. Learn more at worldvision.org slash chosen. When you have a problem, Fox 12 gets you answers. The violence continues. When crime hits too close to home, we want to make sure your voice is heard. We're listening and ready to confront your problems head on. How can Fox 12 help you? Tell us at kptv.com.